Good morning, and thank you for joining us for this UC Health Facebook Live to help educate the community on the novel coronavirus, or COVID-19. I'm Matt Martin, and today we're joined by Dr. Carl Fichtenbaum, professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases in the Department of Internal Medicine at the UC College of Medicine and a UC Health physician, and Dr. Dustin Calhoun, prof associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the UC College of Medicine and medical director of emergency management for UC Health. Dr. Calhoun, we'll start with you. Uh, can you tell us how the hospital uh, is preparing to for something like this? So, uh, Matt, we spent a lot of time just continuously preparing for uh, what we refer to as all hazards. So we try and make as many of our plans um, broad um, to cover as many things as possible. So as the word novel means, these are unusual, new, um, haven't seen before. So plans that are broader tend to work better, and then we focus as we go. Um, so the nice thing is that the plans that we have in place actually from the word go um, were sufficient to cover everything that was on the CDC's recommended hospital preparedness checklist. Um, so we from the beginning had things set in place and what we spent time doing since that time um, is focusing it, um, doing staff re-education, figuring out where the holes are for this specific virus because um, everything that you deal with has some small specificity to it, little areas of um, the specific personal protective equipment, that sort of thing. So we focus there. Um, um, we spent a lot of time um, drilling, so we've done a few different infectious disease drills over the years, some of the tabletop level, some at the higher level where we actually move um, uh, pretend patients around. Um, and we work closely with sort of healthcare partners, um, other hospitals, as well as the health collaborative in this region and the Ohio Department of Health um, to make sure that we're staying up to date with what their capabilities are and what they expect our capabilities to be. And specifically, how is UC Health preparing for the novel coronavirus? So with novel corona, the, the really nice thing is, and I'm sure Dr. Fichtenbaum will go into more detail with this, but um, the nice thing is that unlike Ebola, where we were really implementing a lot of things that weren't the typical for our staff, the levels of PPE, the, the types of equipment they were using were different. Um, the things that we're doing for these patients are along the lines of standard, not standard precautions, I apologize for using that term because that has a very specific meaning, but they are normal workflow for our people. Um, using airborne precautions, using eye protection, using uh, contact precautions, um, droplet precautions, those are things that our, our folks use day to day with patients. Um, so it's less a matter of reinventing the wheel as it is sort of refreshing memory, making sure we're putting um, uh, appropriate things in place in the right areas, making sure we have the right folks knowing exactly what they're doing. But all of our standing plans really have applied very well to where we are with this. Um, so we're doing some refresher education. Um, the other big part to this that's been a very big moving target has been more along the lines of how do you catch these patients, right? How do you find them? Um, and that took a, a big turn very recently uh, with the removal of geography as an absolute or contact as an absolute um, in the, uh, the definition of the patients. We were looking essentially purely for patients who had either been in contact with someone known to have it or having been in a geographic area that was known to have high amounts. Um, at this point there are patients that we're seeing that don't fit those definitions um, and with the higher level patients, the sicker patients, um, we're intended to consider those as potential COVID-19 patients even without either of those risk factors. So that's some of the big turns that we're having to deal with and that's really where most of our preparedness um, work is right now is trying to focus in on how do we how do we find these patients as early as possible. And what are some of those plans that are in place right now? So we have um, a number of things as far as the st standard work, uh, trying to isolate patients who um, develop or who demonstrate evidence of um, of symptoms that could potentially represent having infections that could spread. And that doesn't, doesn't just apply to these patients. Right? I think a really important thing for everyone to remember is that any individual is at much higher risk from influenza. Um, than they are from anything else. Um, they are, at this time of year, much more likely to catch influenza, um, and the population as a whole is more likely to be harmed by influenza. Um, now, an individual patient has a, uh, a higher risk once they've acquired the disease, for sure. Um, so those are some of the things that we're looking at is continuing and sort of uh, making more robust some of those efforts that we have as far as um, catching those patients, getting them into the right kinds of protection, getting them isolated. Um, so we've worked on uh, some of our entry portals, so where we bring patients in, how do we as early as possible catch those folks and making sure that um, we're on top of our game with that. Again, it's more of a uh, upspooling of what we normally do than it is big changes. And then how does UC Health work with uh, other partners to ensure our entire community is prepared? 
So we spend a lot of time interfacing with other organizations. So a big example um, and probably our highest interface is the Health Collaborative. So we spend a great deal of time just on all preparedness areas, right? So not just infectious disease, but looking at um, chemical concerns, looking at natural disasters, looking at terrorist events. We spend a lot of time with them. Obviously recently that's been focused heavily on infectious disease. Spent a lot of time there. We've been in regular contact with the Ohio Department of Health um, and CDC with phone calls, webinars, um, and more direct contact, trying to make sure that we're close with that. Um, we're also very heavily integrated in the community when it comes to things like our EMS agencies, fire departments. Um, so we provide medical direction for a number of those fire departments um, and EMS agencies, which allows us to, to assist them in preparations for this. Because if, if they're not detecting these patients, um, they're at risk, and then they also put their remainder of the healthcare system at risk. Is there anything else that the community needs to know about the novel coronavirus or how UC Health and the community are preparing? I think the most important thing to do is, and you keep hearing this on the news, right, is don't panic. Well, everybody always says that when there's something scary that makes everyone want to panic. Um, but I think it, it is, uh, as trite as it may sound, it is true. There are a lot of preparations that have gone into this way before December. Um, there are a lot of preparations that have, have been mounting on that since December. Uh, we are prepared to deal with this um, in an appropriate fashion. Um, the biggest thing people can do is sort of helping to prepare themselves, um, needing to keep in mind the simple things that they're reading about. Social distancing, right? If you have symptoms, do everything you can not to spread them to someone else. Whether that's the cold, the flu, or COVID-19, that's an important thing to do. So simple stuff such as hand hygiene, cough hygiene are really important aspects. Um, and then being in touch with your healthcare provider, um, not using the emergency department necessarily as your go-to for small symptoms. Certainly, if you have a life-threatening or concerning situation, that's what the emergency department is there for. But centralizing a lot of people who don't necessarily have to be there at times like this can just lead to increase in spread. Um, keeping in mind things like when, when situations significantly increase. So if you look at some of the geographic areas around the country, or sorry, around the world right now that have higher populations of some of the measures that go in are uh, closing schools. Well, that's not, that's not a crazy thing. The state of Ohio closes schools periodically for influenza outbreaks. So we're not talking end of days kinds of uh, occurrences. But having personal life plans in place for what do you do when the school that your child goes to gets closed? How do you manage that part of your life? Um, are you okay with your prescriptions, right? So if a small non-essential business is closed, are you gonna have enough of your prescriptions? So those are the kind of important things to be putting into place in your personal life that will sort of help the community as a whole. Dr. Fichtenbaum, to give our audience a little bit more perspective, what exactly is novel coronavirus or COVID-19? Yeah, so COVID-19 is part of a family of viruses, coronaviruses. Uh, there are uh, more than 80 or 90 of these viruses in nature. Most of them affect animals. There's only six that are known to affect human beings, this being the seventh virus that's known to uh, affect human beings from this family of viruses. It's best known because of its relatives, SARS, which emerged in about 2003, and then MERS, which emerged in uh, 2012. Um, those were viruses of the same family causing more severe types of respiratory problems like severe pneumonia or what we call adult respiratory distress syndrome where people actually need help breathing from our machines and have very serious disease. And those were actually much more serious than the COVID-19 appears to be at the moment. And I think time will tell because we need more data and more information on the severity of this illness. Um, so it's a virus that affects our respiratory system it's passed to human beings uh, through what we call droplets, meaning that the little tiny particles that contain the virus that you can't see with the eye are either uh, taken by the hand onto the surfaces where it can get, uh, it, it can infect us, uh, and also we can breathe in the droplets and they can infect us as, as well. So, um, where it came from, we're not exactly clear, but most of these come from animals. We think this particular one may have come from bats. Uh, and 
These are not uncommon. Many diseases pass from animals to human beings. We have a scientific name for them. We call them zoonoses. And so many of the different diseases that have affected us particularly contagious diseases, have traveled from different species. So for example, bird flu. We had the H H5N1 disease that we had was a bird flu virus that came from birds and then was introduced into human beings. Uh, this one may be from bats than the human beings. So these viruses are out there. Um, this is not uncommon. This has been happening probably for centuries, uh, you know, for, to human beings. And uh, each one is a little bit different. Um, and obviously when it's new, everybody gets a little bit more concerned, but time will help us understand how severe, how mild it is, uh, and what people can do to help protect themselves, and how do we treat it, how do we manage it. And how is it different from uh, common cold or the flu? So uh, the common cold and the flu are caused by different viruses, and they have different effects. The common cold is usually a fairly mild illness caused by something known as rhinovirus. This usually causes sneezing, coughing, achiness, Occasionally you have a little bit of fever, uh, but most people recover within a few days and they're sick maybe for, you know, three to five days on average. Influenza or the flu is caused by different strains of influenza that circulate in the community every winter time. And this can be a much more serious illness with high fevers of 101, 102, shaking, uh, you feel muscle aches, um, you can have the same cold symptoms, runny nose, sneezing, coughing, but you can actually get a pneumonia from influenza itself. So you may feel a little bit more short of breath, occasionally some chest pain. And then some of the concerns that occasionally happen are a secondary infection from that where another bacteria, because your immune system and your respiratory system has been damaged, can take over and that can lead to even more serious problems. And uh, it's really hard to tell those symptoms from COVID-19 because people present with the same sorts of problems, sneezing, coughing, fever, achiness, uh, shortness of breath. And just by looking at someone, I can't tell as a physician which particular illness do you have. And you start to speak on, how does coronavirus spread? Well, it spreads through what we call droplets. Um, I think we're still understanding how contagious it is and how exactly it spreads. Droplets are these small uh, microscopic particles that will contain virus in them. Uh, they have all sorts of uh, proteins and materials from our body uh, that allow the virus to survive uh, for periods of time. And those can be passed through your hands, touching your nose, touching your mouth, touching your eyes. Um, and also through uh, inhaling them when you're a very close distance from someone. Um, if you're further away, so for example, if I'm uh, in another room, um, I'm unlikely to have this uh, passed to me through just breathing it in. Um, so I think that it, closer contact is probably what's needed, but I think we are still early in this epidemic and we need more information about how it's exactly transmitted. Is it similar to influenza? Is it different from influenza? Uh, and so I think we'll know more probably in a few months about how exactly it's transmitted and how far or close you need to be to someone. I think there are some important myths that we should be very careful about. So number one, if you receive a package from somewhere, uh, you're not going to get COVID-19 from a package. It's not going to survive shipping. Um, viruses are not hardy, hardy enough to survive that kind of thing. Um, if, you're, if you're out in public and you're doing fine and you, and you uh, happen to walk into the grocery store, that doesn't mean you're going to catch something from somebody. Now, if somebody is right next to you and they're coughing and sneezing and you know, they're within a very close proximity, that's more concern. But you know, just being out there in general is not how this is gonna be transmitted. In most cases, it's been close contact. So family members passing to other family members, 
patients at residential facilities or nursing homes, uh, passing it to one another, passing it to healthcare workers who've been in direct contact with people. Um, these are the common ways in which this kind of virus has been passed. As we continue on here, Dustin, I want to thank you for your time here. I know you have another commitment here at noon. Yep. If you have a trip planned that includes a flight within the U.S., what precautions should you take? Should you wear a mask, postpone your trip? So let's talk a little bit about how you protect yourself. Say you're a healthy person and you need to go somewhere. So wearing a mask is unlikely to be very helpful to you uh, because again, droplets are not something that are always inhaled. Uh, they can be passed uh, when you get them on your hands and other surfaces. So the best advice I would say is when you're traveling, make sure that you wash your hands for 20 to 30 seconds with soap and water. You can sing the happy birthday song. That's a really good time wise to help you understand how long that is. Do that before you're gonna eat, before you touch your nose, mouth, or eyes. Try to remember uh, when you're traveling on a plane, maybe you bring some hand sanitizer with you so that before you eat or you drink any liquids that you clean your hands again, just to make sure they're clean as well. If you yourself are sick, don't travel. Um, you should wait and postpone your trip. Uh, get a doctor's note so that uh, hopefully you won't take a big hit on your airline cost. Uh, but it's better to be safer. If you're coughing or sneezing, please cover your nose and mouth. If you cover your nose and mouth with your hands, that's a good time for you to then wash your hands so that you don't actually pass it to other people. This is what we mean by good hand hygiene and really trying to make sure. If you don't have hand sanitizer with you, you can use the in the elbow technique, which is I'm gonna cough or sneeze into my elbow here so I won't be taking my hands and accidentally touching other people's surfaces or, or transmitting this to somebody else accidentally. Um, I don't think at this point in time there is a need for us to postpone or not travel within the United States. I would agree, however, traveling to places where COVID-19 is spreading, places like South Korea, Italy, Iran, China, it would not be a good idea to travel there and you should postpone your plans if you can. Another question we have from our viewers, uh, who should wear face masks? Uh, people diagnosed with coronavirus or people trying to avoid catching it? Uh, I think if you have a cold and you have to go out in the public, if you're sick, you should wear a face mask. Why? Because that's gonna help prevent you from spreading the droplets or airborne aerosolization of viruses to other people. If you're healthy and you are not having any symptoms, uh, a mask is not necessarily gonna help prevent you from catching a disease. So that part is not necessary. Why are public health officials so concerned about the novel coronavirus? Well, I think right now the information we have is, is that the severity of this illness may be a little bit more when you measure it by person to person compared to influenza, and we don't have specific proven treatment for it. So those two things, I think, make us a little bit concerned. Clearly, influenza is a, a tremendously important problem for us. Every year we have between 30 to 40 million Americans that get influenza and somewhere in the neighborhood of between 10 and 50,000 individuals die every year from influenza in the United States or its complications. So clearly this is an important problem. But if COVID-19 is as catchy, as transmittable, person to person, as influenza, then there is a risk that many more people could be affected. And if the risk of someone dying from this is higher than influenza, then I think that's what makes us a bit more concerned. And so, you know, we, we need time to understand this virus and know how serious it is. So I think a healthy amount of concern is always appropriate and good planning. You started to speak on it earlier. How can people protect themselves from contracting the coronavirus? Well, I, I think, again, it's the good hand hygiene that you use, particularly in public and at home. And if somebody in your family is sick, 
um, then you know you have to make sure that you're going to try and protect yourself as much as possible by using very good hand hygiene and good coughing and sneezing techniques again at home to prevent it from your family member passing it to you. That's where the danger lies. It's typically not necessarily going out. The other places are of course work and schools. Um, now a lot of people cannot afford to miss work, uh, particularly when they're sick. Uh, sometimes you miss work, you lose your job. I think we need to ask our employers here to be a bit more forgiving under these circumstances because we're trying to prevent the spread of a disease that can harm people. And therefore, if someone is sick, it's probably better for them to stay at home and not get everyone else at work sick with the same virus. In the same way, you got to keep your kids at home as well. And that can have a burden on society, obviously, because we want things to keep moving. Most of the time, if people aren't that sick, they usually wind up going to work. And those are the kinds of things that make me more concerned is because that allows for the spread through your coworkers and through the community. Dr. Fichtenbaum, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And that'll do it for this UC Health Facebook Live. From Marketing Communications, I'm Matt Martin. We'll see you next time.